thank you all for attending. And really, yeah, thank you to uh, IDT for, um, uh, for several things. One, for hosting this event, but um, really just being a wonderful collaborator over the last year. So it's made a big impact on, uh, on, my, on my lab. So in, in my lab, so we uh, study um, uh, blood coagulation. So that's our, uh, that's our focus. So I'm not an, an expert on, uh, on you know, an expert on nucleic acids or, or, or liposomal uh, transfection agents, but uh, luckily there's people here that, uh, that are, that have really helped us achieve some of the things that I'll tell you about today. So I'll tell you um, my perspective as a, uh, as a, um, uh, a researcher in a, in a different area with a different focus on blood clotting and, and what, uh, what we've been able to, uh, to achieve using the, um, the technologies that uh, were, were just, just mentioned. Okay, and so, um, so I'm going to start with uh, blood clotting and uh, try to motivate you know, why, we, uh, why my lab is interested in uh, blood coagulation and hemostasis. And so there are a couple of reasons for this. Um, first, just to uh, tell you what a hemostasis is. So I'm not saying uh, homeostasis, I'm saying hemostasis. And so this is the, the normal process of, of blood clotting in order to, uh, to stop uh, blood from, uh, from leaving our vasculature if we're injured and from exsanguinating. Okay, so um, a couple of points. So, one, so bleeding during trauma is a, uh, is a, leading, is a leading killer of, uh, of people worldwide, um, particularly of, uh, of young people. It's recently changed in the U.S. due to overdoses, unfortunately, but um, but it's still a major uh, major problem. But young people, I mean, younger than uh, 45, so um, not uh, you know not, not talking about just kids. So people are, I guess, uh, people get smarter around the age of 45. So I'm looking really looking forward to that. The um, the other thing I like to mention, yeah. So bleeding is also associated with uh, um, with uh, surgical deaths. So I think this is obvious. I think we can all re relate to bleeding in, in one way or another. The other thing that hemostasis uh, controls, or when hemostasis uh, stops to be able to control, is the, uh, the unwanted uh, formation of blood clots. And so this is thrombosis. So this is also a problem. So over 50% um, of all deaths, actually the last thing that happens is a clot. And so even though it might be a bacterial infection or cancer that makes us sick, uh, in the end it's usually a, a clot that gets us. Um, and uh, yeah, so the rupture of atherosclerotic plaques, uh, this is what leads to the, this leads to the formation of blood clots, which then cause heart attack, uh, most stroke, pulmonary embolism, and deep vein thrombosis. And so it's a, it's a big problem. So a lot is, uh, a lot's known about the blood coagulation system, and, uh, and many technologies have been developed over the years that have resulted in uh, some really important uh, drugs that, uh, that most of us have, uh, have, uh, have taken at one point or another. Okay, and so you don't have to, uh, you know, there won't be a test, you don't have to memorize this, uh, this slide, but what I'm trying to convey is that, uh, yeah, this system is very well uh, um, understood. And so there, these are the, the proteins and enzymes involved in, uh, involved in blood coagulation. And so what happens in the beginning, there's a, if there's a damage to the vasculature, there's a stimulus that uh, gets exposed that, um, that activates a cascade of enzymes that results in the clot in the end. And um, yeah, so a lot is known. And from this uh, knowledge, there have been a, a number of uh, technologies uh, developed that have led to, uh, to drugs to control um, bleeding and control thrombosis. And so, uh, yeah, and so many uh, uh, from all the biochemistry and the biotechnologies that have developed, these have enabled a number of approved therapies. But as I mentioned on my uh, uh, you know, first, first slide, after the title slide, uh, new technologies are, are still needed. And that's what uh, we'll talk about today in, in using uh, uh, RNA-based uh, based approaches and, and uh, LNP, uh, lipid nanoparticle-based approaches uh, towards this. So I just wanted to um, uh, go over some of the, uh, uh, some of the types of uh, biotechnologies, the products that, uh, that have led to uh, things for, for blood clotting. And so uh, anticoagulants and antiplatelet um, drugs, these are also called uh, blood thinners. This is a class of... Uh, of, uh, of agents used to, uh, to prevent uh, blood clots. Yeah, and so almost all of us have taken uh, these before because uh, aspirin falls into this uh, category. You may not have taken it for that reason or you might be taking it every day for that reason. Um, another class are thrombolytics. These are um, enzymes that degrade uh, blood clots. Uh, hemostatic enzymes are used uh, during surgery. So purified uh, enzymes are used for people with bleeding disorders or for people that uh, um, may have been uh, injured during trauma. Um, and yeah, so there's lots of different types of uh, blood transfusions and uh, advances in blood transfusions that are 
used to control, uh, control bleeding and other conditions, as well as a number of uh, protein therapies for, uh, for hemophilia. So, um, yes, yeah, so there's, uh, um, there's a big area here. So the market size for these is, is well over uh, 30 billion just for uh, proteins and small molecules. This is a wide variety of uh, processes. But um, it's still, uh, still an issue. Bleeding is still an issue and for uh, people with bleeding disorders and for um, people without bleeding disorders. And uh, thrombosis is still a problem. And so we need, uh, so new technologies are still needed. And, um, and yeah, so can we, uh, can we use uh, gene therapy to, uh, to modulate these? So that's um, one of the questions that we're trying to address uh, in my laboratory. And then a second question is, um, can we use uh, these, uh, these gene therapies to answer uh, biological questions about uh, blood coagulation? So we're looking at it from um, both perspectives. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so coagulation factors are, uh, are ideal targets for, um, for siRNA uh, therapy. And so most, uh, most of these coagulation factors are, are synthesized in the liver. And so the liver is, a, is an ideal uh, place to, uh, to knock down um, proteins. And so I don't think this has been mentioned yet, but uh, if you do an uh, IV injection of uh, lipid particles in uh, you know, less than 200 nanometers, um, you know, tens of nanometers to a couple hundred nanometers, these will accumulate um, preferentially in the, in the liver. And there's been lots of advances and there's continued advances to get these into other, uh, other tissues as well. But uh, the liver is, a, is, is the most, uh, most efficient. Um, tumors are also a, a nice area to get um, lipids to. But uh, yeah, and so for the coagulation factors, most of these are made in the liver. And uh, it's not just coagulation factors. There's a wide variety of blood proteins made in the liver. And yeah, there's a, there are a lot of diseases related to the liver. So there's plenty of, uh, plenty of opportunities to use uh, lipid nanoparticles to, uh, to modulate um, things made in the liver. Okay, and so um, coagulation factors are also prime targets for SNA therapy because um, you can easily take blood and analyze it and look and see if, uh, if there's been any changes to the, the proteins there. <clears throat> and so, um, so I mentioned lipids can go to the liver and, uh, and this system here that's been mentioned a couple times, the, uh, the lipid, uh, lipid formulation that's used with this uh, approved drug, this uh, preferentially uh, accumulates in the liver. And so, um, yeah, and so the idea is to, uh, um, that, we, uh, um, that Peter uh, uh, Cullis said he recommended to me a, a, couple, a couple years ago was to use uh, lipid formulations that, uh, that he and uh, Marco Cipollini in the chemistry department here at EBC, that they, uh, um, that they developed to, uh, to modulate blood coagulation factors. And so it started by uh, um, you know, me telling uh, Peter about my interest in uh, blood clotting. And he said, well, are, is there any proteins that you'd like to uh, inhibit there. I said, oh yeah, there's a lot of them. And he said, okay, well, here, it's pretty easy to do if you use uh, this uh, technology that I'm about to mention, to be telling you about. So we're not the first people to uh, try to uh, um, express proteins or to knock down uh, proteins in the, in, the, in the liver related to coagulation. And so um, there's a, people have used uh, uh, RNAi to, uh, to decrease the concentration of protein, coagulation proteins. And so um, this is a nylum group along with uh, people from, uh, from UPenn. And so this was an uh, uh, agent to, uh, to decrease the concentration of an uh, anticoagulant for, uh, for, uh, for hemophilia. And so a clinical trial was uh, initiated, it was halted, but it's been restarted. And so there's a lot of uh, um, opportunity, uh, opportunity here to, uh, for these uh, proteins. So that's one example, but there are, um, as I showed before, there are many uh, coagulation factors and almost all these are related to uh, some disease. So some of them are extremely uh, prevalent, you know, things like heart attack and stroke, and other ones are, uh, are rare, rare childhood disorders related to, uh, to blood clotting. And so there's lots of opportunities here. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to circle the, the um, proteins that are made in the liver. So not all the coagulation um, modulators are here, but, um, but the ones circled in green are all made in the liver and uh, theoretically easy to uh, target if you have the right uh, technologies. Um, and so some of these have a dashed line around them. And so those uh, I want to emphasize are, uh, are a bit different. They're not necessarily made in the liver, but they're regulated by things that are. So they're either partially made in the liver or they're regulated by a protein that is made in the liver. And so one of these is a, uh, is the first protein that I was uh, that talked to Peter uh, about. 
Um, so this is factor 13. So this is a, you know, every, uh, you know, biochemistry labs have a favorite uh, enzyme. It might be a long list of, uh, or a favorite protein. It might be a long list, but this one's ours. So it's factor 13. And um, there's no previous in vivo inhibitor for this, uh, this uh, protein. So uh, people had tried for many, many, many years to make these. There's a company that specializes in making inhibitors for this protein or for proteins of this class. But one had never existed that, that could be used even in small animal models. And so we were able to, so in a matter of months, we were able to make, a, uh, make an inhibitor for this, not by um, creating a, uh, you know, a, a huge chemical library and screening that library in, uh, in cells and working up from there, but just by uh, um, yeah, getting, you know, um, talking to IDT, getting a few siRNA sequences, um, packaging it through what is now the nanocore with uh, Peter and, and Dom and, um, and others. And then, uh, yeah, so we were able to make an inhibitor for this. So that's what I'll tell you about. Okay, so this is a, um, so there's a protein factor 13. That's a, and factor 13, the active part of it is 13A. So it's not made in the liver, it's actually made in the bone marrow, a place where you, is hard, traditionally hard to, uh, to transfect. But the, um, the pro, and there's another protein, this factor 13B, that stabilizes it. And so, um, so what we did, decided to do is go after that uh, 13B, the stabilizing protein. And so, um, yeah, so 13A, uh, once it's activated, it's a transglutaminase, so it, it stabilizes blood clots. And uh, make sure that if you start to form a clot in a wound, that, the, that that clot stays there for a sufficient amount of time and keep the blood inside of your blood vessels. Okay, and um, yeah, and so what, uh, so I can, I'll take, so what I'll do is I'll show you the, the process that, um, that we went through here, and I'll show it a, a couple times for a couple different proteins to give you a sense of, uh, what um uh, what you might want to do if you're trying to uh, use uh, um, use siRNA and lipid uh, lipid nanoparticles to uh, to knock down a protein, this might be the process that uh, you'd go through. Maybe you've already some of you already gone through this in the past. Okay, so the first thing that um we did, and when I say we, I mean uh, Amy uh, Strilchuk, a, a graduate student in my lab. Uh, so the first thing that um first thing she did is she, is that she took the um, uh, three different uh, siRNAs and lipid nanoparticles and injected them into mice. So we started with mice, not, uh, not cells, just a few mice each, and looked to see uh, how much uh, knockdown there was in the, uh, in the liver of uh, this uh, um, stabilizing protein 13B. And so, um, yeah, this is, the, uh, this is just the, uh, the best one. That, uh, and, so, and so the amount of mRNA in the liver was uh, decreased quite a lot. So it was decreased to a uh, Below 10% in just uh, in just a week, and it stayed uh, it stayed uh, below 10% for uh, for several weeks. And so this was uh, um, the best of the three. But I did want to mention, you know, now we've uh, so we've we've tested at least somewhere between 20 and 30 different siRNAs or different coag for uh, for about four or five uh, coagulation proteins, and from uh, the siRNA from uh, um, IDT and the lipids from uh, uh, Peter. And um, so all 20 of them resulted in a uh, knockdown, uh, all 20 to 30 of them, every one has resulted in knockdown in vivo without, any, without detecting any uh, knockdown of other proteins. Now, it doesn't mean that we didn't hit some other ones, but, we but it wasn't obvious and we haven't detected that. Okay, and so, yeah, so we looked at the liver and we did qPCR to look at the mRNA. Then what we did is we, we looked at the blood and, uh, and looked to see if the protein was decreased in the blood. And both, uh, both 13B uh, and 13A, not showing uh, both here. Actually, I think this is the data for 13A. Both 13B and A were, uh, were decreased. So this is just looking at uh, the amount of uh, 13 in this control siRNA. And so you can see the signal means that there's the proteins all there. But if you look at the siRNA targeting uh, this protein, there's a lot less uh, uh, protein there at uh, day seven, and it keeps on going down, day 14, day 21, and then a little bit starts to come back after about a month. And so, um, yeah, so I was able to remove uh, most of the protein from, uh, from the blood uh, without having to do an extensive uh, small molecule screen. Okay, um, and so what we uh, usually do is, uh, so we have the one month data, and at that point, we're usually pretty excited, and then we sh start shipping these out to, uh, to a wide variety of other blood coagulation researchers that have been uh, waiting for, uh, for inhibitors for these reagents for, uh, for sometimes decades. So, um, but the next step we do is we look and we see how, uh, can we, can we keep continue dosing these and how long can we keep the knockdown down for? And so this is just an example of that for, uh, for, 
factor 13. And so you can see we can keep the levels uh, pretty low, um, so below 20% and usually below 10% for, um, uh, yeah, for many, many uh, months. This is in days, so up to, in this case, up to 150 days. But, uh, yeah, so you can, by injecting, by dosing every uh, three weeks, we can knock down for, uh, for a long period of time. Okay, and so um, I, what we usually do next is try to answer some uh, biological uh, question. And so I won't go into the, the details uh, here, but there are some biological questions about this uh, protein, factor 13. And the questions people often ask are, okay, there's some disease, some multiple sclerosis is uh, controlled by 13. Is it because of the 13 in plasma or is it because of the 13 in platelets? So these two different pools. And so with the siRNA and LNPs, it's only decreasing the plasma. And so we can ask questions about a, um, a biological question about 13, whether it's the plasma 13 or the platelet 13 that's contributing to these different diseases. And so, um, yes, yeah, so this slide is just showing that uh, we can specifically knock down the plasma, but leaving the platelet uh, fraction uh, intact. And yeah, and so there are also questions about uh, which of these uh, um, pools of 13 contributes to the cross-linking of fibrin, the clot. And so through these studies, we can uh, determine that. And yeah, so we, almost all the plasma 13 is cross-linking fibrin, and the platelet 13 is doing very little, but it is making some contribution to a cross-linking. So this is just a Western blot uh, for fibrin. And so we can see that you know, without platelets, we don't see a lot of uh, high molecular weight fibrin, the cross-linked fibrin. But with the platelets, we, see, uh, we do see uh, a little bit of this uh, high molecular weight uh, material. Okay, so, um, so I just wanted to give you an example of a, uh, um, of a protein that uh, can knock down. But I do want to uh, motivate this a little bit more besides just the biological question, but uh, you know, I think it may be uh, therapeutically relevant. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's problems with uh, preventing uh, thrombosis. And so, yeah, the formation of clots that lead to heart attack and stroke. And there are many uh, anticoagulants out there. And so, um, uh, and so anticoagulants are usually taken to, these are taken to prevent thrombosis, but they have major side effects of uh, bleeding. So there's many millions of people that are on anticoagulants, but um, there's even about twice the number of that that should be on them, but are not because, uh, because of the risk of uh, bleeding. Um, and so this is a, uh, yeah, and so these bleeds can be very severe, such as ones in the, in the brain. And so, um, yeah, so there's a big gap there. The target product profile uh, for anticoagulants includes these things. So as I mentioned, you definitely want to prevent thrombosis. Um, you want to have a low risk of bleeding. You want it to be long acting and uh, you want it to be immediately reversible. So if someone is uh, an, on an anticoagulant, but they experience uh, some sort of bleed, such as uh, from, uh, from trauma, you want to be able to immediately reverse that. And so these are the limitations of the current uh, anticoagulants. The ones that, are, that have come out in the last 10 years, uh, direct oral anticoagulants or DOAX or heparin, which has been around uh, quite a while. And so, um, yes, there's some limitations to these that we think we can uh, overcome with, uh, um, with this, uh, this particular um, siRNA uh, agent. Okay, and so um, as I mentioned, factor 13, it, uh, it cross-links fibrin. And so this is the blood clot here that forms at the end of this coagulation cascade to try to uh, you know, prevent blood from leaking out. And so 13 cross-links this, but it doesn't control the initial formation of the fibrin. And, um, and so one, uh, one idea that's been around uh, quite a while was to, is to, uh, to try to in inhibit the uh, stabilization of uh, fibrin. So the idea there was that if a clot does form inside of a blood vessel, that it could uh, uh, would be more easily cleared by our body. And so many, many inhibitors, people have been trying to develop inhibitors to this target here. Um, thrombin activatable fibrolysis inhibitor, but they've struggled because this has other functions in vivo. And so instead, we wanted to, people have for a long time been interested in factor 13, and so we think now we have a uh, uh, inhibitor for that. Um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned, yeah, so hemostasis, you know, it is a balance between the formation of the clot and the degradation. And, um, and yeah, so in most cases, there, if there's a bleed, a clot will form. This clot becomes stabilized, such as by 13, and then it gets cleared. It gets degraded afterwards. And so in, uh, in hemophilia and in blotting, um, in, uh, in other bleeding disorders, it gets cleared fast. And so the clot disappears too fast and re-bleeding occurs. This is a common problem with bleeding disorders and during trauma. 
Normal hemostasis, you get a nice clot that forms, it's stable, and eventually, when the time is right, it clears away. In thrombosis, uh, the clot's sticking around too long. And so can we modulate these uh, to, uh, to, to help with bleeding disorders and help with thrombosis? And um, so the hypothesis is that by modulating the degradation of the clots, we can, uh, we can use this as an approach to treat um, bleeding disorders and thrombosis. And um, yeah, so I'll tell you about uh, um, a little bit more about what we've been doing with uh, factor 13 and then another, uh, another uh, target towards, uh, towards bleeding disorders. And so um, I want to mention that, uh, um, and so we're testing these in a, a couple different, uh, a, a few different animal models. And I think the reason why I mention this is going to highlights the, uh, um, you know, some of the, uh, the ability to use uh, 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 lipid nanoparticles in gene therapy. So these siRNA LMPs, the uh, point I want to make is that they can easily be scared, scaled, uh, scaled to large animal models. And so, yeah, so that's useful for, uh, for, for small animals, for mice. But, um, but in mice, there are other options. I mean, there's genetic knockouts. There's all kinds of different disease models. But, um, uh, but that becomes challenging as you go to uh, larger animals. And so we've uh, started a uh, rabbit study for factor 13, and we've started a canine study for, uh, for a different uh, target. But uh, the reason why um, I think these reagents are useful is because it's really hard to make uh, genetic modifications in these animals. But with, the, uh, with, uh, with siRNA, with the other gene therapies, it's much easier to, uh, to make these genetic modifications. Um, okay, and so, uh, yeah, so all of these are accessible um, uh, genetic models, you know, using, uh, using these, uh, these techniques. Okay, so um, for the, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, factor 13 and what we're doing towards uh, turning it, uh, you know, turning it towards uh, being useful for thrombosis, and then I'll mention another uh, another target and the and what we've been doing there towards um, uh, toward, uh, towards large animal models. Okay, so for um, for SNA knockdown of 13, so yes, yeah, so we looked at the liver. Okay, we had knocked down, looked in the plasma for weeks and for months, and okay, the protein was uh, gone. The next step was to make sure that it actually had a functional effect. And so I don't want to go into too many details about uh, this assay, looking at the, the functional, uh, functional effect of it, but I will briefly just mention that, yeah, so we use this assay to, um, to detect how, uh, how, how stiff a clot is and how fast it can degrade. And with a control siRNA that we didn't expect it to have any function, this is what it looks like. So the, the clot is forming and it has this certain amplitude, this certain stiffness, which is normal and then the clot starts to degrade over time. If we remove, use siRNA and inhibit factor 13, we get a much faster degradation. And so the idea, if this were in a, um, a person or an animal, this clot would clear um, more quickly to relieve that thrombosis. And this is just quantifying that, showing that there's a, uh, has the same maximum amplitude, so it can still form the clot, but that it uh, lyses, uh, lyses faster. And so the first animal model we did was um, to, uh, to look at a, a thrombolysis. And so it made clots in the carotid arteries of, uh, of mice, and then uh, looked and see if, the, um, if this siRNA LNP reagent, whether it influenced how fast that, uh, that clot disappeared. And um, yeah, and so what you do is um, expose the carotid artery, put a ferric chloride solution onto it, that really makes that vessel upset so that uh, it uh, becomes thrombosed. And then um, there's an agent that you inject a low concentration of to help, uh, help clear that clot. But we'd like to see if the siRNA had an effect there or not. And, um, and so it did. And so in the control, uh, control siRNA, um, once uh, um, we were looking at the amount of blood flow in this uh, vessel. And so once we formed the clot, the blood flow was pretty low. And so there wasn't a, uh, the, the thrombus was there and the vessel was blocked. There was very, very little blood flow, no blood flow in most cases through that uh, blood vessel. But if you um, look at the mice that had been treated the week, about a week before with the siRNA, now um, the blood flow is able to open back up. So after we delivered a little bit of clot buster, the um, blood vessel is open, able to open back up with blood flow coming through, and that didn't happen as much with the, um, the control siRNA. And so there's more blood flow with this, uh, with this agent. And so we looked at a, uh, another animal model, a uh, bleeding model. With, uh, with this and compared it to a current uh, anticoagulant. And so with a current anticoagulant, if we look at the amount of uh, blood loss in this uh, animal in a bleeding model, the current anticoagulant has a lot more blood loss than an untreated uh, animal. And so this isn't a good thing. So you want an anticoagulant to, 
keep you from forming a clot but in, inside your blood vessel, but if you're bleeding, you don't want to bleed a lot, lot more on this drug. But with the siRNA for factor 13, we didn't see that increase in, uh, in blood loss. So it had a very similar amount of blood loss. What's interesting is that uh, there were differences in the blood clot, which are, which are you know, biologically, uh, from a biological perspective, are interesting. So the clot would uh, um, form and uh, break and form and break, and it would constantly go back and forth in this, uh, in this cycle. So that was an interesting uh, biological question we answered. So we're still uh, um, working on this particular, uh, this particular protein. And so we're doing a, a rabbit study now, looking at a, um, bleeding in the rabbit, and then a collaborator is looking at a thrombosis model in uh, in these uh, in these rabbits, and um, yeah, and so so we branched out from there. We haven't done every one that's in green here, but we're working on a couple of them here, as well as some other blood proteins that are not uh, not on this uh, schematic. And so there, before there wasn't an NVO inhibitor, and uh, now there uh, now there is. So. I want to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing to um, uh, knock down a protein um, in, a, in a canine model of, a, of hemophilia. And so in hemophilia, um, so dogs get, a, get hemophilia too. You might, have, you might have a pet that's had a bleeding disorder, know someone that has. So there's a, you know, due to the way that dogs are, anyway, dogs are susceptible to, uh, uh, to bleeding disorders. Okay, and so um, and a collaborator has, uh, has colonies of, uh, of these. And so, yeah, and so what, um, first what we did was we, we had a target we were interested in. I'm just going to call it an anticoagulant protein A, ACA. And um, yeah, so the first thing to do is just make sure that we could knock down this target in mice. And, um, and so we did that. And so we screened uh, three siRNA in uh, mice. All three resulted in a nice knockdown, and one resulted in a, uh, the best knockdown, you know, below, uh, well below 10%. We looked, this is in the... Uh, um, you know, we looked in the in the blood and measured the amount of uh, protein in the blood, and we uh, you know saw that yeah one sequence um, removed all, almost all this protein from blood, and another one had a little bit left, and this is useful too. So some collaborators are working with you know want this. They want to be able to control how much protein uh, they have for their biological studies. Um, we did make sure for this particular protein that they would have a uh, have an effect on uh, on uh, blood clotting, and so this one also did. So again, in, a, um, in this case, it's making the, the, uh, the blood clot um, uh, more stable. This is for a bleeding disorder where you want a stable clot. And so normally the clot would lice like this, but with this siRNA reagent in mice, the clot was more stable. So the clot stuck around longer, which would be useful um, if there's a bleeding disorder. Okay, and, um, and this is just quantifying that data there. So, the next thing we did was, okay, so this is working really well in, uh, in mice, and so we wanted to use it with a collaborator in their uh, canine models of uh, hemophilia. And so I want to tell you a little bit about the process that, uh, that we went through there. And so initially we were thinking of doing the same thing. We we're going to take three sequences, we we're going to uh, screen them in, um, uh, in these animals, screen all, screen all three sequences and find the best one. But that was, uh, yeah, you know, um, a little bit expensive. It wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, astronomical, but but is also uh, probably not the most efficient way to do it. And so what we and so in mice, it's uh, I think it's much faster and uh, much easier. And um, and maybe you know it's possible to screen in the, in the mice, but in the canine, it's less feasible. And so what we did do there is we did screen in vitro first in uh, cells. So we got uh, um, uh, canine hepatocytes and treated them with the siRNA. LNPs to find out which, uh, which sequence was the best. We did have to look at a couple different uh, um, sources of hepatocytes. So uh, if you're interested in, you know, if, if your goal is to uh, do these uh, in vivo and, you know, translating it into larger animal models, you know, if you get hepatocytes, and if you're interested in the liver, which I'm sure some of you are, if you get, you know, it may not be the first, uh, first source of uh, cells that work well. So you might need to get a couple different sources. So we saw this with uh, canine. We also saw it with uh, with the rabbits, but um, and with the so eventually we did find a cell uh, uh, hepatocytes that expressed this uh, mRNA for this target. Once we had that, we screened the uh, um, we screened the sequences again. We got we got three from uh, IDT, and uh, all three of them work. So uh, thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful. The um, and then uh, yeah, so and, and one was uh, the best, and so then we uh, tested this uh, in one um, uh, in uh, in one dog. And so, yes, this is the amount of this uh, protein. I'm just calling it ACA. And so this is the amount of protein that we saw um, before the injection. 
And after the ejection, we uh, decrease. This protein was, uh, we haven't yet been able to detect it in the plasma. And then we were really surprised for how long. So after uh, six days, 13 days, 20, 26 days, there was, uh, this protein is gone. And so we're still, uh, still analyzing this, waiting for it to come back. I'm sure it will, it hasn't yet. And of course, we looked really closely at, uh, at uh, um, toxicity in all kinds of different uh, ways in this animal. I'm happy to, to talk about that with, um, with you. So, but, uh, but after uh, there was some uh, acute in the uh, very first days that were working out, uh, you know, related to the infusion and what drugs we gave them during the infusion. But after, uh, after a few days, there, we, there was, we did not detect uh, um, uh, liver toxicity or, or the other uh, markers of, uh, of uh, toxicity. So we were pretty, uh, pretty excited about that with this, uh, with this technology. So um, uh, yeah, and so this is just looking at, uh, at um, uh, so we collected uh, blood and looked at, the, um, looked, at, uh, uh, looked at the properties of the blood to see um, if, uh, if the clotting was changed, and it was. And so again, with, um, with this type of, uh, with a canine model, with, and with people with bleeding disorders, you want a stable clot, and that's what we saw. So after, um, before the animal was treated, the clots had this level of stability, around 50% of, uh, of uh, the clot remained after, we, after a certain amount of time. But with the siRNA, now the clot was very stable. So the clot uh, wasn't degrading um, within that amount of time um, in this in vitro test. And so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the story I wanted to tell you about um, uh, yeah, how, uh, how easy it is to uh, knock down uh, liver, uh, liver proteins. And of course, um, uh, we and others are interested in other tissues as well, and we'll continue to uh, to, to work on that. Um, you know, and I'll share with you, you know, how the, the steps that you might take in uh, in uh, small animals, the steps that you might take in in larger animals, and um, yeah, so uh, and to tell you a little bit about uh, about blood coagulation as well. Okay, so um, yeah, so most of the work oh, this uh, happened too fast. Most of the work was done by uh, by Amy and uh, Amy Stolchuk and uh, Jerry. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Amy and Jerry. And um, of course, to uh, Peter Collis, as well as Ed Prizedale and Ed Conway, who are uh, blood clotting experts, as well as uh, Tim Nichols, who is a blood clotting expert. And uh, I thank you to Dom, too, for helping with the uh, formulations and, uh, and these funding support, especially uh, um, Enmin. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's the story I wanted to tell you. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming and listening. <laughs> Questions for Christian? Here, I'll bring the mic down there so the uh, out-of-town guests can hear. Thanks. Uh, so for factor 13, is there a way of differentiating between, say, you have a cut on your arm and there is a capillary that has a little clot in it? Is there some kind of way of differentiating the two using liposomes or something to actually say, well, we want to get rid of the, the clot in the capillary and leave and stabilize? leave the one stabilized that is you know, on, on the skin. Is there a way of actually differentiating those? Or is it just a fine balancing act between the two? Right. Yeah, I think it is a, a fine, uh, fine balancing act. But there's a, couple different, um, there's a couple different balances you can tweak. And so, there's a, um, and so there's like the rate of formation as well as the rate of inhibiting that formation. And that's the balance that, uh, that most uh, approaches will uh, mm -hmm. Will will take, and that's a yeah. I was trying to say that's a really, it's really hard to balance that because if you don't form any clot at all, then it's a big problem. So the other the other balance I mentioned is yeah between the the formation and the and the degradation, which is a different uh, different set of enzymes, a different process, and that's been uh, um, very not as well explored. And it depends where way. it is too, right? Uh, yeah, it does yeah. depend on it does depend on uh, where it is. Yeah, especially for degradation, the the enzymes. Uh, um, some of the triggers for that need to come out of uh, some of the, uh, is not in the blood, but in the, t in the tissue, the vasculature. So it does make a difference which uh, blood vessels, but, uh, but I don't, um, we're saying, yeah, there, there, as far as I know, there's no technologies that can distinguish between uh, sort of things on the surface versus uh, inside, except that you're talking about uh, topical hemostatics, but, um, but, uh, but it would be, uh, but it's definitely uh, be really interesting if it could, uh, could do that. Yeah. Uh, very beautiful talk, and in your presentation, you show the pathways that for control the coagulations. And then I ask for different animals that you show the mouse, the rabbit, and the ducks. Yeah, are this the pathways exactly the same or different from different other animals? Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's a uh, um, point I wanted to uh, wanted to make but forgot. Yes. Yes. So thank you uh, very much. The um. So the. 
Yes, yeah, so back to this balance between um, uh, clot degradation and formation. So it's very different in, um, in mice compared to humans. And so in mice, their, uh, their clots don't degrade uh, um, uh, very easily. And so it's not susceptible to a degradation. And so these, uh, um, the inhibitors that are used, so the most commonly used drug for people with bleeding disorders is a, is a small molecule. It's not very good. It's not, you know, but um, that uh, inhibits that degradation. And that molecule has a very little effect in, uh, in mice. And so I think that's been one of the challenges to developing these, uh, what are called antifibrinolytics, is that, yeah, they're not, they're not effective in mice. So that's one reason why we had to go to this uh, larger animal model. You know, I really you know, didn't want to uh, have to have to do that, but uh, but uh, in the mice, that uh, that uh, clot degradation is very different than it is in um, in larger animals, including uh, including humans. Yeah. But so, most of yeah. most of the other uh, all the enzymes are are there in uh, all the different uh, organisms, but uh, the concentrations are uh, and activities are different. The only one that's missing in um, in mammals that's different is a uh, factor twelve, and marine mammals they don't have a uh, factor twelve. But all the rest of them are, uh, are the same. <laughs> okay, thank you. Time for one more question, if anybody has one. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you showed sustained knockdown in the mouse model, I think, with three week uh, intervals on your dosing. And then you looked out and, and saw sustained knockdown for three weeks in dogs. So do you feel like your mig per kg dose is? is uh, locked in for three weeks of knockdown, you would need sustained dosing, or um, have you done some optimization to see maybe what the dose is that would give longer duration of, of knockdown? Uh, yeah, we haven't um, uh, tried a couple different uh, doses. We, we haven't we haven't op we haven't tried to uh, uh, optimize that. So yeah, so um, especially you know coming from perspective of a uh, um, you know, someone who's is uh, interested in uh, blood coagulation. The way that I viewed it is, okay, I want to use, uh, wanna use uh, as similar as possible the concentrations and formulations of that, uh, that approved drug. So I figured by, by doing that, that'd be the fastest route towards, uh, towards addressing some of these uh, thrombotic and bleeding uh, disorders. But, um, but yeah, but it is a great point that, um, yeah, we should uh, try different dosages and that might extend the uh, knockdown in the mice. And definitely with the, um, you saw with the uh, dog, the really long knockdown, yeah, we probably can go uh, lower. I, I don't know if that's going to change the timing or not, but I assume that it looks like we can looks like we can definitely go lower there. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Appreciate that. That's great. And. Thank you. Thank you.